Amen. Thank you for that. If you have your Bibles tonight, let's go to the book of Acts, chapter number 20, please. Acts chapter 20. And of course, uh, we've uh, already been here close to an hour. It's been great. It's been absolutely phenomenal. But we do want to uh, jump into the preaching as quickly as possible. And so uh, if you found your place there, if you're on your way to finding your place and you're physically able, would you stand with us as we read our text tonight, Acts chapter number 20. And uh, the title of the message tonight is Effective Transition Within the Local Church. Effective Transition Within the Local Church. I, I, I want to begin, uh, begin reading in verse number 32 although we're going to look as our text from verse number 13 all the way down through the end of the chapter. But we'll begin reading in verse number 32. And Paul is speaking here. He's speaking to the elders in the church at Ephesus. And he says in verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, Ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more, and they accompanied him unto the ship. Father, would you bless our time tonight in the word of God? Lord, would you help me to preach this message thoroughly, and yet, by the same token, being aware of, of the hour? Lord, would you um, Lord, teach us something about effective transition from one generation to the next, from one leader to the next within the local church? It's so very, very important. Help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> well, we've heard much tonight about church planning. We understand from Scripture and from the book of Acts that Paul was a church planter. He was not necessarily a pastor. And I suppose there is a difference. Obviously, the men that perhaps were at this meeting that pastor was at this last week that said, God has called me to plant a church. Uh, some of them, they have the heart and the desire to plant that church and to stay with that church long term. Similar to what Dr. Roy Thompson did here when he planted the Cleveland Baptist Church in 1958. However, there are some that have more of a church planner's heart. In other words, going to an area, establishing a church, getting it up off of the ground, transitioning it on to the next uh, leader who will take it, grooming a man, training a man, and then establishing him there as the pastor of that church, and then going and starting all over again in another place. There are some that have that heart. It's sort of, I suppose, the heart of a, of a missionary. Most of the missionaries that our church supports, they go to a specific place. They spend their term there. Usually it's about a four-year term. And uh, they come back and, and uh, they report on a church that's established. We see their video presentation of the pictures that they have. And, and, uh, and then they say, now here's what we're going to do. When we go back, we're going to this town and to this location. And we hope to do the same thing there that you've seen done here. And, and Paul was that type of an individual. He had a spirit that just longed to take the gospel into new geographical regions and, and to plant evangelistic churches in these new communities. And, and as we read the book of Acts, so we understand the timeline of Paul's life, he never stayed anywhere really all that long. In fact, he's leaving here, the church at Ephesus, and he's saying goodbye to the leaders there. And as far as we know, he spent more time in Ephesus than he spent just about anywhere else. This was, this was Paul's heart. And, and we find here that, uh, that, that Paul is, is bidding farewell uh, to the leaders at the church at Ephesus. He's in a, he's in a location called Miletus. And he's heading actually to Jerusalem, and uh, he's going there for the Feast at Pentecost. Uh, Paul would now be transitioning into the last portion of his, of his earthly ministry, and, and uh, this portion of his earthly ministry would find him in prison and persecuted more than any other portion of his ministry. In fact, the saints had warned him, don't go back to Jerusalem there was a lot of animosity directed towards Paul because of his previous life and because he had turned from those ways. And he was now a preacher of the gospel and establishing churches. And a lot of the saints said, Paul, don't go back there. If you go back there, there's going to be problems, there's going to be issues. And yet Paul had this longing, this yearning to go back to Jerusalem. He believed God was leading him there. And so he's sailing back that way and he stops in Miletus and he calls for the elders of the church at Ephesus. Ephesus was about 30 miles north. 
He realizes, I don't have time to, to go there myself. And, and if I get there, it'll be hard for me to say goodbye. I'll probably end up spending longer there than I want to spend. And I need to get back to Jerusalem for this feast. I feel like that's what God is leading me to do. And so rather than going there himself, he calls for the elders. And they come and they meet with him. And he shares the thoughts that are found beginning in verse number 13 all the way through verse number 38 with a church at Ephesus, which really is one of the greatest churches in all of the New Testament. He calls the leaders of this church and he officially transitions this church and the ministry to their care. He says, look, you know how I started the church. You know what I've done. You know what God really has done as he's used me as this human instrument, as this human vessel. And now I am, I am turning it over to you. It is yours. I want you to take it from here. I... I um, I want you to know that if a church is going to live on into the future, the present leadership must give thought about this type of thing. And they must make plans for the day that will inevitably come when they will no longer be in their current position. You do realize that all of us have a greatly limited lifespan. And I'm praying that, that this church will, if the Lord tears is coming, that this church will long outlive me. I'm praying that this church will continue to go on, that it'll continue to be a lighthouse and a beacon here in Northeast Ohio, to continue to be a place that gives hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to plant churches and to send missionaries all around the world. But listen, if we're going to enjoy that future 30, 40, 50 years from now, we must make plans and set ourselves up in the best position to succeed. And so that's really what this is all about. Paul is saying, listen, uh, the church at Ephesus is going to outlive me. It must outlive me. It is going to be a beacon there in Asia Minor. It is going to be a model church. And yet God has called me on. God is moving me in a different direction. Paul is not ready to die as at least 10 more years of life with which to live. And yet he is bidding farewell. He is saying goodbye to this church as far as his leadership role and capacity is. You know, the church has done great harm by having a pastor. And really by having leadership across the board who refuse to face the reality that, that man and those leaders will one day no longer be capable of pastoring that church. In other words, here, here's what I want you to understand. The Cleveland Baptist Church is not Kevin Folger's church. It was never Roy Thompson's church. And in the future, it's not going to be my church or anybody else that might come down the line. The Cleveland Baptist Church is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is his church. He's the one that planted it by using a man. He's the one that has given us the candlestick that we have. And if someday he chooses to remove that candlestick, that'll be his choice. But listen, this church has never been the church of the pastor. This isn't your church. This isn't my church. This is his church. He just lets me be a part of it. And I'm thrilled that he does. And Paul understood this truth. He understood this teaching. He understood this concept that, that while Paul was the human instrument through which the church at Ephesus was planted, it was never Paul's church. And Paul understood that this church had a responsibility to live long into the future. And I got to tell you, this thought is intensely personal to me. It's interesting, you know, I began preaching through the book of Acts in the beginning of 2017. God brings us to this portion of scripture and as I'm studying it this week I'm thinking to myself man I've seen this played out before I've had a front row seat to this if the Lord tarries is coming I'm going to sit in the front row again I'm going to watch it play out as well it's sobering it's moving to me to think about this I want you to think about our church's history 60 years two pastors anybody that I share that with as I have opportunity to meet folks and to mingle with folks they, they just can't hardly believe it. God has been beyond good to us as a church. I mean, he really has been. Some of the, some of the greatest turmoil that can come uh, to a church family is failure in the leadership positions. Uh, the, the man that God has planted is the under-shepherd of the church for him, to, for him to fail or perhaps for him to get a sense of wanderlust and to say, you know, I'm not happy here anymore. I want to go somewhere else and and do something else. I'm not saying there's never a time that God leads a pastor away, but I'm just simply saying well, we, we have been greatly bl blessed and benefited by 60 years of ministry and just two men Amen. that have led this church. God has been very good to us. I watched as a, 
Well, as just a young boy, as our church transitioned 23 years ago from Dr. Roy Thompson, our founding pastor, to my dad, I still have vivid memories of some of those, some of those moments. I, uh, we, you've, heard this, you've heard this told before, I'm sure, but we were, on, we were on a family vacation when the church voted on my dad to become the co-pastor. I believe it was the year 1990. I would have been 11 years old. And, um, of course, at 11 years old, I have no idea what our family's getting ourselves into. And to really be honest with you, I had no choice in the matter. You know, this is, this is my dad's calling, and I'm just kind of along for the ride. I can, I can tell you those days were far different from the day and age in which we're living now. I remember the vote was taking place on a Sunday. I believe it must have been in June, because this is when the vacation took place. And, of course, we were, three, we were several hours behind. We were out west, and, and I remember my mom and dad had a little bit of an anxiousness about them. I get it now. If things went south, we were probably going to be moving somewhere else, you know, and, and they'd have a house to sell and, and that sort of thing. And I remember, I remember we pulled over somewhere out west on, the, on a highway, and we all huddled around a payphone. I, I, now, I gotta, those of you that are like 18 years and younger, I've got to explain to you what that is. <laughs> the kids are like, a payphone? What's that, you know? And, and, um, and, and I, you know, I... I I don't know that my dad placed this call as a collect call, but he might have, you know, back in those days. And, but I, I remember we all huddled around the phone, and, and he, heard, he heard the words. The church had voted, and, and, uh, and they had voted 98% that he would become the co-pastor and at some point in the future that he would uh, succeed in, in, in uh, Pastor Thompson's ministry here become the next pastor. And, of course, I was just an 11, 11-year-old boy. By the time it was all said and done took place in 1995. By that point, I was 16 years old. It's about a five-year period there. And again, I remember watching that. It was September of 1995. And of course, growing up as just a boy, all I had known was the ministry of Roy Thompson as my pastor. And and now, you know, uh, you know, my, my, my pastors, you know, he's, he's living down the hall from me. That's a little intimidating and a little, a little scary that changes things just, just a little bit, I suppose. And God is certainly, God certainly blessed in that transition. There are and there are folks all around the country that, uh, that, that ask of, of him. And when Pastor Thompson was alive, tell us about that and how that all came to be. And yet the truth of the matter is, is that I believe that's God's plan for the local church. I'm grieved when I, I'm grieved when I hear of a, of a pastor that just says, okay, I'm, I'm done here. I'm leaving. Good luck. Figure it out. I'm happy to help if I can, but I'm heading somewhere else. And there's, there, there's another place that our, that our family is moving. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the bride of Christ. This is the church of the living God. And we see here a template. We see here a model of effective transition within the local church that the, that the leader turns it over to the, to the next generation and says, here it is. It's yours. You take it. I think to myself just a moment ago, we sat here and we listened as Brother Mike and Miss Kirsty sang. You, I don't know if you, certainly you probably weren't thinking along these lines, but I was because I knew where we were going in this message. And I thought to myself, that's the next generation. Here's a, here's a couple that grew up in, in this church and they were raised here. They were trained here. And their parents and, uh, brought them to church as just, as just children and, and raised them to love the Lord. And, and I'm sure they'd tell you they, they didn't always make the right decision. They didn't always do the right thing. But at some point, God got a hold of their life. And listen to me, if Cleveland Baptist Church is going to go on, we've got to have more people like that. I'm here to tell you that, uh, that if I am anything at all, uh, it's because of the investment that folks in this congregation of folks that have already gone home to be with the Lord, uh, they have poured something into my life. They invested themselves in me. My generation, listen, my generation, the generations that come behind, man, we will greatly benefit from the investment that some of you folks that are a little bit older have made in this church. I still remember, I still remember coming Back in the day, and I still remember the trash cans that were on the ceiling. You remember the lights that, that were there? I still remember some of the look and, and that sort of thing. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I mean, that, was, that was okay back then, but man, God has been so good to us. You know, you know why that happens? Because some of you decided that you were going to give. You sacrificed, and maybe you went without so that we could have some beautiful pews. So we could have some more updated lighting that looks a little bit more attractive and 
And some of you, you have invested and you have maybe, maybe saved from maybe going on the vacation of your dreams and done something maybe a little bit simpler so that you can give into an offering where we can buy buses. Where you've given to an offering so that we can support missionaries who are going all around the world and are serving Christ. And I'm just telling you, I'm just here tonight to say thank you. Thank you. Because I, I enjoy what I enjoy and my children enjoy what they enjoy. And, and who knows, someday I, I may be a grandfather and my grandchildren, I'm praying that they'll enjoy the same Cleveland Baptist Church that I grew up in and that I enjoyed. I'm afraid that sometimes we don't truly recognize and understand just what we have here. We're blessed beyond measure. As I began to study this passage, I realized this passage provides a practical template for an effective transition from one church leader to another. Maybe, maybe we can even take it a step further and say from one generation to the next. I want us to consider three thoughts tonight, and I must hurry. Number one, I want you to consider the example set forth by the Apostle Paul. Paul re recognizes, or I should say represents, uh, the, the church planter here. Uh, he is the beginning. Uh, he is the older generation. It begins in verse number 18, and he says, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. I want you to notice, first of all, that Paul set an example indeed. He set an example in his actions, the way that, the way that he lived, the way that he conducted himself. He set, an, he set an example by way of behavior. Shares with us several ways in which he set this example. First of all, he set an example indeed in, in the way of consistency. He says at the end of verse number 18, he says, After what manner I have been with you at all seasons. The outgoing leader of the church at Ephesus had modeled for them consistent Christian living in all seasons, according to Acts chapter 20 and verse number 18. Things weren't always good in Ephesus. They got off to a great start and things were rolling along. But at some point there arose somewhat of a, almost like a riot. There was a huge rally that happened within the city of Ephesus. And Paul literally was run out of town. For preaching the gospel and for seeing lives changed, he was run out of town. And yet Paul says, listen, in all seasons, whether we were flourishing or whether we were struggling, whether we were in the midst of great trial or whether we were in the midst of great blessing, you have watched me. You have seen that I have been the same and that I've lived the Christian life every single day in the exact same way at all seasons. And I'm here to tell you that I have watched you, you older generation, I've watched you. We have watched you, my generation, and the generation younger than me that's coming after me. We've watched you as you've modeled consistent Christian living in all seasons. Now, that's not to say that everyone has done it exactly right. There may be even some that at one time sat in these very pews and, and lived the Christian life in a certain way. But I'm simply saying I'm taking my eyes, my eyes off of those that have failed. And I'm going to keep my eyes first and foremost on the Lord Jesus Christ. But I've also got my eyes on some people who have been around here for 40 or 50 years. I'm here to tell you that your consistency has been a blessing. You've set an example indeed. He said I've set an example by way of consistency. But he said also... In the realm of humility, look in verse number 19. He says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. I want you to know that Paul did not hesitate to do difficult things. Paul was not too good to have a meal with certain people. Paul wasn't too important to sit down with certain people and share the gospel with them. Paul says, I have served the Lord with all humility of mind. Paul was willing to forgo personal pleasure that he might get the gospel to people. He references that. He says, the lying in wait of the Jews. And these, these people, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to destroy him because he was faithful to preach the gospel. He endangered himself in order to spread the gospel. The ultimate humility that one might be willing to give his life for someone else. To think so little of myself that I might sacrifice myself on behalf of you. And yet that's the way that Paul lived. 
He set an example in deed, consistency, humility. But notice, secondly, he set an example in word. Notice what he says in verse number 20. We see here his teaching. He set an example. Verse 20, the Bible says this, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Look in verse number 27, if you would. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Listen, Paul in his teaching did not give the Ephesians what they wanted, but rather he gave them what they needed. We all understand as parents, as people in positions of responsibility and authority, uh, that, we, that, that we don't have a responsibility to give people what they want, but we've got to give them what they need. You see, my, uh, some of my children <clears throat> would want candy all of the time. And I, I want them to love life. I want them to enjoy it. I want them to love me. But listen, I'm not a very good parent if all I do is shove candy down their throats. I, I'm not a very good parent if all I do is just allow them to do anything that they want to do. No, no, listen. The responsibility that I have is to give them what they need, not to give them what they want. And yet we're living in a generation that is raising our children by and large and and is, and is really governing our own lives by saying, it's not about what I need, but it's about what I want. It's not about what they need, but it's about what they want. And can I tell you that that has creeped into the church? We have a whole generation of pastors and even of denominations that have just said, well, they won't come and listen to this anymore. They won't have any of this. And so what, what can we give them that will cause them to come in? Well, listen, what you give them with what, what you get, what you get them in with is what you're going to have to keep them with. And so if we're going to constantly cater to the, uh, to, to the crowd and just say, well, whatever you want, we'll give it to you. Where does that end? I can tell you where it ends. It ends very poorly. It ends in destruction and devastation. It ends with Christians who are very, very weak, as weak as a, as, as a, as a, and corrupted as a child who has fed nothing but candy his whole life. He's given nothing but fluff. There's no substance to it. There's no strength. There's nothing that's solid. And so Paul says, listen, I, I, didn't, I didn't lift my lift my finger into the wind and say, which way is the wind blowing? Okay, it's going that way. So I'm going to give them that. He says, no, no, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I have taught you line upon line, precept upon precept. His teaching, he set an example in. Notice his preaching. Look at verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 25. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. But listen to the statement, verse 26. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. You know what Paul's saying here? He is saying there's not a, there's not a soul in Ephesus that has not heard the gospel. It's quite a testimony, isn't it? It's a man that had quite a ministry, quite, a, a, quite an open door and effectual that was opened unto him there in Ephesus. He says, I am telling you the truth. He is not, listen, he is not, he's not just, you know, preacher talk here. You know, sometimes, sometimes preachers, you know, kind of fall into that. You know, how did you have the day? Oh, a whole lot more than we probably did. I estimate that we have this many or that many or how was your offering? It's a whole lot more than... It probably the bottom line is going to show. Sometimes, sometimes preachers can get caught, get, get, get caught away in that type of thing. I want you to know something here. The Apostle Paul is under inspiration of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Listen, he, he's not fabricating things. He's not making up a lie. He's not making his ministry look better than it actually is. No, no, listen, the Apostle Paul says, I'm leaving the city of Ephesus, and I am pure from the blood of every single individual in this town. That's quite a preaching ministry. Paul set an example in word and in deed. And again, I'm just here to say uh, that the, the older generation, whether it was Dr. Thompson, whether it was my father, uh, they have set an example in these areas. They haven't been perfect. No man is perfect. And Paul wasn't perfect either. But God has used them. And we, ought to, we ought to honor. And we ought to be thankful. We ought to be appreciative for what God has given us. But notice, not only the example set forth by Paul, but I want you to consider, secondly, the expectation of the new leaders in Ephesus. In verses 28 through 35, Paul lays out some specific expectations. You all voted a little bit more than a year ago that I will become your pastor at some point in the future. And I want you to know something, that as I study this passage of Scripture, I realize that I have a responsibility. 
I have a responsibility that my life line up with what the expectations are found here. This is a practical template. This is what every Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church should expect out of their leader. I'm sad to say that we have seen, we've seen in, over the years in churches and in Christianity as a whole, we have seen pastors that have come in and they have devoured the flock and they have been wolves in sheep's clothing. And, and, and perhaps maybe they didn't start, start out that way, uh, but, but they have failed miserably. And that could still happen to any single one of us. But I want you to know something that Paul says, here is the expectation. Here is what you are to do. And I want you to know that based upon the authority of the New Testament, that this is the expectation, this is the standard that you ought to hold me to. And I'm praying that God would help me to live underneath the, the restraints of this standard because it, it is high. But notice, he says, what they are to do, first of all. The leaders in Ephesus, first of all, were to heed. Notice verse 28, the Bible says this, Take heed thereto, excuse me, therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. You know, Paul makes it abundantly clear that the Holy Ghost had made them overseers. And it's very possible that there's someone in this auditorium tonight that maybe doesn't necessarily like me. It's possible. Shocking, maybe, but <laughs> possible. I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious, of course. But that, listen, that, that, is, that is possible. It's possible that I've rubbed you the wrong way. Maybe, maybe something that I did in the past, or maybe an attitude that I that I conveyed or that I possessed. And if I've offended you, I'm so sorry. I mean that sincerely. I, I love each and every one of you in here. But I want you to know something. You all, you all have not called me to pastor this church. The Holy Spirit called me. The Holy Spirit has, has given this calling to me. The Holy Spirit, if, if I'm going to carry it out, he's going to have to equip me to do it. He's going to have to give me the ability and the power and the strength and the wherewithal to be able to do this. And Paul recognizes, he says, listen, the Holy Ghost hath made you an overseer. This is not something that I set out to do. I didn't call myself. In fact, if you know my testimony, there was a time in which, in my mind, I thought anything but that. I'll do just about anything, anything where, where I don't have to labor under that type of responsibility, and yet I could not get away. This is what God had for me. As a junior in high school, I surrendered to the call to preach the gospel. This is, listen, this is a work that the Holy Spirit has called me to do. And, and while, I, while I'm grateful that, that you all saw perhaps something within me that would say, yeah, maybe he can, maybe he can do this. He can carry this on. I, I want you to know something, that, that the Holy Spirit is the one that has called me to this position. And that's what, he's, that's what he's saying here. No question about it. And as a result of that, we are, we are to take heed, therefore, unto ourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made us overseers. Dr. John Phillips said this, God's people in the world are indeed a little flock. They're called that by the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 12, 32. He said they're defenseless and much despised by the world, but they are infinitely precious to God. I want you to know something. The world might look at the Cleveland Baptist Church. All of 500 of you gathered here on a Sunday night, and they might say, well, that's nice. Isn't it sweet that they get together and they, they think that they're making a great impact? I want you to know something. God looks at us and he says, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh, how I love those people. Oh, how I sent my son Jesus to die on the cross to save those people and to call them out of the world into this local assembly that they might show forth my glory in Northeast Ohio. And I want you to know something. You are precious to God. And the pastor, you have every expectation that the pastor view you as precious and special because you are. He is to heed, but notice, secondly, he is to feed. Verse 28, the Bible says this, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, with he, with he, which he hath purchased with his own blood. You know, a pastor is a shepherd. He is to lead sheep to green pastures so they can have plenty to eat. And one of the chief responsibilities of a pastor is to feed his flock from the wealthy resource of the word of God. I'm so glad that I don't have to come up with green pastures on my own. They're right here in this book. 
I'm so glad I don't have to carve out a, a, a springs of, of water and, 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 and give them to you. I'm so glad I don't have to do any of that. No, it's already here in this book. God's already given it to us. It's my responsibility to prepare and to, and to serve a, a, a meal from the Word of God to, to feed you and, 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 to, and to take on that responsibility, but I'm just, I'm just following Him. He gives the message. He prepares the meal in my heart and in your pastor's heart when they stand to preach. May we, may we receive what is being given. Notice another responsibility is there to protect. In verses 29 and 30, We don't have time to spend much time here, but he understood that grievous wolves, verse 29, were preparing to enter in among the church. You would find that this prophetic statement would come to pass. And that it wasn't long before there were false doctrines spreading around Asia Minor. Of course, we come to to the book of Revelation and John writes of the seven churches. And in just about all of those churches, he has to address issues and problems. Things such as the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and and other things. And grievous wolves had made their way. They had infiltrated the church. And Paul understood that. And he says to the next generation of leaders, it's your job to protect the flock. Notice, he says, your job is also to remember, verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. My father will tell you that one of the greatest things, that one of the greatest resources that he had in the years that, he, that he's been pastor up until several years ago when Pastor Thompson went home to be the Lord was the ability to be able to pick up a phone and call him and say, hey, did you ever deal with this? And how did you deal with it? And the ability to be able, maybe now he can't pick up the phone, he can't talk to him, but now he can remember. I watched him for 37 years. I saw him as he stood in the pulpit and as he, as he thundered forth the word of God. I watched him as he administrated. We worked side by side together. And those memories come flooding back. And, and Paul says, I want you to remember the three years that I was with you. And when you come to a problem, you come to an issue. Remember the things that I did and how I conducted myself. And how I dealt with the issues and problems that were there. He, he says to remember, he says that they are to be content. Verses 33 to 35. You know, there's a side of every human being to see how they can take advantage of a particular situation that they find themselves in. There's a lot of pastors that have taken advantage of the local church. And Paul urged them to resist this temptation and to be grateful for what they have and to not be greedy of filthy lucre, as he would tell Timothy later on in his epistle to Timothy. And if they needed more, if they found that there was a a, a, a lack or there was something that was missing, he says you're to go out and you're to work with your own hands. You're not to take advantage of the local church. And you're to be content with such things as you have. That's That's what you ought to expect out of your pastor, out of your leader. A man who is going to heed and a man who is going to feed. A man who is going to protect. A man who is going to remember. A man who is going to be content. This is what... They were to do, but Paul said there's also something that they were to know. First of all, they were to know God, verse 32. He says, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Paul commended them to God's care. Paul says, I'm not going to be able to be with you all the time. We're living in a, he's living in a day where there's no email, there's no telephones, there's no fax and, and that sort of thing. And Paul is saying, listen, I'm leaving you in God's care. And I want, I want you to know something. If you're in the hand of an almighty God, there's no better place to, to be than that. And while it was, it's always a difficult thing to watch another generation pass off the scene, if that generation has left the succeeding generation in the hands of God, they can die in peace. Commending, commending them to God's care. He says, you're to know God. The comforter would lead, would lead these Ephesian elders to higher heights than the apostle Paul could ever lead them. They were to know God intimately and to be led by him. And you have every, every right to have that same expectation for your leader. Not only to know God, but to know God's word. Verse 32 says, in the word of his grace. And so we see here the expectation that the future leaders were to, were to live their lives and to do their ministry under. And I want you to notice last thing we'll be done tonight is the emphatic farewell in verses 36 to 38. You know, all good things must come to an end. You know, there's a lot of people that don't like change. I think probably most of us don't like change. But you know, sometimes it is, it is inevitable and often it's, it's necessary. 
Nothing, nothing lasts forever. We understand that. The only thing that lasts forever is, is everlasting life that was given to us through Lord Jesus Christ. Every relationship that you and I have is only temporary. As difficult as that might be to think about, we must understand in the years to come that this church will continue and carry on and yet many of us will perhaps move on to other places or perhaps we'll even leave this life and go to the next. I want you to notice this farewell, first of all, was spiritual. The Bible says in verse 36, when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. I can imagine this prayer was was not a real quick, let's just get this over with. I can imagine this was quite a, quite a prayer meeting. I can imagine that the Holy Spirit of God, you could sense his presence in that room on that day. Now the Holy Spirit was leading Paul on. He was headed for the uncertainty of Jerusalem. And the Ephesian elders, they faced the uncertain attacks against the church that were sure to come. And Paul said that there were grievous wolves that were to come in. And so before they departed... They knelt together and they prayed. It was a spiritual farewell, but notice it was an emotional farewell in verse 37. You know, a spiritual leader makes a profound impact in the lives of those he is called to lead. As you think about your pastor tonight, you understand that he's buried some of your loved ones. He was maybe one of the first people that you called in the middle of the night when your mother died or your father died. Or maybe even a son or a daughter. And he was there with you. By your bedside or the bedside of your loved one. For some of you, your pastor is a man who, he married your children. Stood on the platform on this happiest day of your life. If, it's, if you're marrying off a son, it's the happiest day of your life. If you're marrying off a daughter, maybe it's not. But, but he stood there and he, and he wed your children. He married them. He counseled with them. He preached the word of God to them. He was there before your surgery early in the morning. You were on his mind even, even when he's on vacation. You're there. I wonder how they're doing. Even when he's trying to get away from it all, he's trying to unwind just a little bit. You're there. It's the heart of the shepherd. He's thinking about the flock. He's thinking about the sheep. And when it's time for him to go, it was an emotional farewell. The Bible says that they wept. They wept sore. And they fell on him and they kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words that he spoke. I'm never going to see you again. Emotional farewell. And then it was, thirdly, it was a final farewell. Paul says, I'm never coming this way again. This is it. I've led you to Christ. I've discipled you. I've been with you in your tough moments. And now God is calling me on. But listen, this is all part of his plan. Change, it's difficult, it's hard. They would see Paul's face no more. This farewell was final. You know, I'm thinking of so many churches that did not take the admonition in Scripture, did not follow the apostolic plan here that is given to us in Acts 20. And as a result, they've suffered greatly. Perhaps maybe some of those churches no longer even exist. Because no plans were made for the future. Can I say thank you, church, for thinking about the future? It's, it's, it's making a difference. It matters. It's, it's important. It's so very important. Just as a working man that has a wife and has children in the home needs to think about life insurance and to protect his family and to protect his investments in his, in his home, in case something should happen to him, the church of God needs to think. It needs to plan for their future. As they look at a pastor who have, perhaps is aging, again, we have been abundantly blessed here. Listen, we didn't come up with this idea. Roy Thompson didn't come up with this idea. God gave him this. This is Bible. An effective transition from one generation to the next. I suppose that perhaps as we end our time together tonight, what should our response be to this message? I don't necessarily think that we need to do anything above that which we've already done, but maybe we ought to just first of all thank God for allowing us the privilege to be here. I think we ought to pray that when this transition takes place, whenever it might be, that God would be in it and that he would be glorified and that we would stay united under his care and 
following Him and not following our own desire and our own goals, but that we would follow Him every step of the way. 